want to take this uh, opportunity to welcome you all here. My name is Robert Hughes with the Open University of the Left. And I think we're going to have a, a, a very interesting uh, session here this afternoon. I'm going to just take care of a couple business items and then I'll hand it off to um, Anthony to uh, begin his presentation. And of course, at the conclusion, we're going to have an open microphone, so we'll have a Q&A and uh, have some good times with that. Um, one, one of the things I wanted to uh, uh, just get past is this problem we're having right now with the website, you know. If you go to openuniversitytheleft.org, you've probably seen we've got that Jeb Sprague event from DePaul back in September, like, locked in there forever. Well, without getting into the details, um, we had some problems with, like, the host and uh, uh, the, the hosting site, that is to say, and uh, we've had some some problems there we're trying to get this thing fixed and and we will uh but uh it might take a little bit longer than uh, actually it's going on way too long but uh, we don't have any uh technical experts so if anybody here is like really smart about that stuff just let us know because uh we could use some help with that um another thing i wanted to do is is that like uh, we are actually going to pass the hat here at some point today we normally don't bother you uh, you know we're not about capitalism or anything like that that's obvious uh but anthony drove up here from springfield illinois and uh, we would like to get a little bit of dough so we can give some gas money you know that's the right thing to do so you know if you got five bucks throw it in the hat that would be nice um anyway we we, we will pass the hat uh, later now, with regards, with regards to the uh, next event, I do have the details and I can give you that and I will right now. Uh, the next scheduled event is going to be Dr. Kim Sipes. He'll be here next month. That's on February 9th at same time, same station, 2.30. Uh, he gave me a, this is kind of a preliminary title, but uh, the three-legged stool, U.S. Empire, U.S. Capitalism, and Global Climate Change. Uh, has, as people have tried to understand what's currently going on in the United States, especially for the purpose of instigating social change, uh, they tend to focus their analysis on U.S. capitalism. Some people try to add an analysis uh, of environmentalism to that, uh, of capitalism. And a few even focus on, of course, the U.S. empire. So we have one or even two explanations, or three explanations for what's going on. So I guess what Sipes is going to argue, if I can say this be his thesis or something, while he is acknowledging that all three of those things are important, uh, they're insufficient in and of themselves to uh, explain <coughs> what's happening. So he's arguing that we have to include all three elements, all three factors in any analysis, meaning U.S. empire, U.S. capitalism, as well as global climate change. And he's going to discuss these approaches and the ramifications, including that in his analysis. So that should be an interesting event. And uh, February 9th, same time, same station. Okay, uh, this afternoon's presentation. We got a title here, The Lack of Critical Class Consciousness by the American Public in the Aftermath of the 2012 Presidential Election. Many on the left are wondering about the path forward and how to go about articulating and implementing a progressive vision for change. In this presentation, Anthony DiMaggio discusses six of the main reasons for why the U.S. political system has moved to the reactionary right in the last few decades. Understanding these reasons is vital before one can articulate how to reverse them, how to counteract, how to take this on. So in this discussion, he's going to, uh, he will provide reasons for why the American public should remain optimistic in coming decades with regards to prospects for reducing economic inequality, rolling back corporate power, and challenging the propaganda of the reactionary Republican right and the increasingly center-right pro-business orientation of the Democratic Party. Anthony will also discuss an overarching problem in modern politics that is namely the lack of critical class consciousness on the part of the American public. He will discuss its causes and consequences as well as what can be done to promote a better understanding of the growing class divide among the American people moving into the future. Uh, class analysis is more important today than ever before in light of the increasingly 
plutocratic, I like that term, <laughs> nature of the American political economic system. Uh, and in light of the economic stagnation and tremendous loss of personal wealth associated with, as we know, the 2008 economic collapse here and the subsequent economic stagnation. Now, just a little bio here. Anthony is taught American and global politics at a number of colleges and universities. He earned his PhD right here in Chicago at the University of Illinois uh, Circle campus. And he is an expert in the study of mass media, public opinion, interest groups, and public policy. He's the author of numerous books, including Mass Media, Mass Propaganda, written in 2008, when Media Goes to War, written in 2010, Crashing the Tea Party in 2011, The Rise of the Tea Party, also same year, and a book in progress entitled, I guess it's a working title, From F F Fear to Democracy, Presidential Rhetoric, and Mass Media, From the War on Terror to the Arab Spring, which has a completion date scheduled for September, when it's the spring of 2013. Okay. Okay, let's welcome Anthony. All right. I wanted to thank everybody for coming out today. Um, thanks for the introduction, Robert. Is this loud enough? Can people hear this all right? Yeah, yeah. yeah. Okay. Uh, so, there's the, I guess the thing that's been going on with Open University is kind of like post election retrospective lately and what to do going forward. Um, it's a weird situation to be in when you look at this last election because so many people rejoicing Obama you know, getting reelected, but it's a really perverse situation because you have one political party which has basically become a center-right party, and you have the other party that is just totally off on the edge, a reactionary kind of right-wing party. They're not even really a political party anymore if you, if you look very closely at their actual strategy, and this has come out recently in the last year or so. I mean, they've been very articulate on a number of occasions saying, we don't legislate, we just block things. So we're just so far off that we're not going to even try to be a party anymore. And so you have this weird system that is really kind of broken down. And, you know, is that, is that the choice we have? You have to have a party that's significantly to the right, it looks, of what the Republican Party used to be 50 years ago, which is the Democrats. And you have another party that's not really a party anymore. They don't really function. Uh, you know, it, it, it takes a Democrat, in this, in this day and age, you're looking at uh, President Obama, who's the leader pushing for budget cuts, <coughs> market-friendly health insurance reform, massive cuts to uh, the welfare state, Social Security, Medicare, and onward. Um, so this is an interesting choice that we have. I would argue it's a really a false choice. So how do we get out of that, this kind of cycle that we've been in? The only way to do that is really to kind of understand where it came from. So. What I wanted to do first is talk about uh, what the understanding is from people who study this in, in political science. Why has the system moved so much to the right? So you really have to understand uh, some of the leading reasons for why that may be before you can combat those. And then that gets back to the idea of class consciousness. Uh, so there are, are, are five big things that I usually like to talk about with my students about why the system has changed so much in the last basically since the 1950s through 70s onward, and, you know, the big change being in the 1980s onward, the onset of this kind of neoliberal politics. Uh, so what are, the, what are the five big things? What has changed so much that might be associated with the movement of the parties to the right? Um, just to kind of go over them pretty quickly, one is immigration policy. That has a lot to do with the changes in the system. Another is uh, the decline of labor unions, which is a really important one. Another one has a lot to do with youth participating less than they used to. Uh, the rise of the religious right is another really big one. Uh, and growing inequality. So those things have been, have been documented in studies. In one way or another, those are related to the, the movement of both parties to the right. And I want to talk about that a little bit before we get into uh, the class consciousness stuff. Um, but just to, worth saying really quickly, we're not a class conscious society, unfortunately. Uh, in 2011, the end of the year, the Pew Research Center, they do a lot of um, polling, a very prestigious group. They ask people this question year after year, and it's, do you think the society is increasing, or just in general, divided between haves and have-nots? And as of the last time they surveyed this about a year ago, almost 60% of Americans said, no, there's no class divide. 
What are you crazy? There's no divide at all. And like, you know, it's like 38% said yes. Just really odd because this is the worst economy in 50, 60 years in terms of prolonged unemployment and stagnation, and yet, you know, people don't believe that. So I'm going to get to that a little bit later. But where, where has the system come from? Uh, one big thing is to do with immigration. The immigration policy in this country has changed pretty dramatically in the last uh, 30 to 40 years. Now, this is something that gets really lamented amongst a lot of right wingers who talk about, you know, closing the borders and the very xenophobic rhetoric. Um, and I don't go down that route personally, and I think most people on the left don't embrace that. But there is something that's happened with immigration policy that's worth noting. And what's happened basically is the non-citizen population has ex uh, exploded. So if you go back to, let's say, the 1970s versus the 2000s, the um, non-citizen population, when you look at voting age, people living in this country, it quadrupled. So we have a policy, and the, the big change was Whereas before it was diff a lot more difficult to get into the country, but relatively easier to get citizenship, now it's a lot easier to get in, but it's extremely hard to get citizenship. And I've heard this story many times from people who uh, have a significant other from abroad, and it, it, it's really extremely hard to even get citizenship, even if you're married. You have to wait years and years to do this. Uh, there was a, a really significant relaxing of immigration quotas from the 1970s onward. And why is this important? Why is it relevant to polarization? Or, you know, the movement of the system actually to the, to the right? Why is it moved so much to that pole? Well, you have a very large number of people who would be pretty likely to be liberal when you talk about immigrants, because they oftentimes don't have a lot, and they're poor. Typically, they're much more likely to be poor. And they have been cut out of the system. So that's a really important point to, to understand because if you made these people citizens or made it easier for them to be citizens, they're here, why not make them citizens? You would have a massive potential voting block of people who could pressure one of the two parties to take on more progressive policies. And that really hasn't happened. Um, so this has really deprived you know, progressives of some sort of, of mass force to, to push politics in a more kind of liberal or left direction. So immigration is a really, really important thing. This is also a great policy for businesses. They love this because you have lots of immigrants and illegal immigrants and even legal immigrants, they can't influence the political system to push in a more progressive direction and they can't unionize and they can't vote. And the, there's all these things that are, are basically denied to them because of their status. Uh, so this is a great way to create a lot of polarization in society and cut out progressive politics. Another really big thing has to do with labor. Labor is obviously, as people know, have studied this, a shell of what it was. So if you go back to the 1950s, you would see maybe one in three Americans part of a union. Well, it's more like 12, 13% today. So it's gone down, uh, it's a third of what it was. And that matters a lot because you have a lot of people who could be a part of a labor union. They could be using their organization skills and their resources to uh, pump money and activism into the electoral process, and that's all gone now. That countervailing force to, to business power is in big trouble in the United States today. So when you cut out a, a big foundation of progressive politics like that, you get a predictable effect, uh, and that's what we're seeing. So from 1950 to 2010, the number of industrial jobs in the United States declined in half. It was about 20% in the 50s, and now it's about 10. So a lot of that you're talking about well-paid, good benefit union jobs, which were shipped to other countries, third world countries. So those things are all gone now with the industrialization. Uh, and you know, the really interesting thing is if you take a look at some of the studies that have been done, there's almost a perfect one-to-one -one correlation between the decline of uh, the percent of unionized Americans on the one hand and the decline in the middle class's share of income, all income created. It's almost perfectly one-to-one. -one. So what you did there is you removed a potentially progressive force from American electoral politics and you just cut, basically cut the guts out of that and you don't have that, that countervailing power that you used to. Um, we're seeing this on all fronts today. So for a while it was private sector, right? Go back to NAFTA in the 1990s and um, you know, failure to enforce labor laws in the private sector. Why do we not have a single Walmart with a union? Because the laws aren't enforced. Uh, 
the National Labor Relations Act and protection of unionization is just not enforced. It's just not being done by the Justice Department and other uh, legal actors. So you just don't enforce labor laws, uh, outsourcing jobs, as we, we know I just talked about. And now it's open season totally because you have governors now who are actively calling for eradicating unions. So the goal in Chicago now is, well, you know, uh, Mayor Emanuel's vision, his quote-unquote vision is, wouldn't it be great if we didn't have public education anymore? <clears throat> Let's just have charter schools. Let's move in that direction and we can close down schools. And uh, this is a really big concern. You've got this in Illinois. The Democrats are doing it. Wisconsin, it's um, the Republican Party. And it's happening across many states. So this is a really big uh, concern. Labor really is a shell of, of what it used to be. I actually did a study of this about a year ago. Uh, if you look at national polling, places like Pew, they actually ask people, well, are you part of a union household or not? And unions don't really have much of a, an effect on, on socializing people anymore, even people in them. So if you were to look at, let's say, liberal versus conservative attitudes and people who are a part of a union, after controlling for all different types of other factors, being a part of a union doesn't really pull people in a liberal left direction anymore. It's only you know, maybe about 20% of all the survey questions out there that have a clear left-right dimension where you can find some sort of relationship between labor and ideology, which is interesting because if you look at the same survey that I, I was analyzing, being a Tea Partier is associated with pulling people conservative in a conservative direction about 90% of the time. This is a group that's been around for a couple of years and uh, you know, thanks to the help of the mass media and that socialization function from Fox and Republican leaders kind of leading the way with that, you have this force that you know, has really, in a lot of ways, pulled people in an even more conservative direction and labor unions really don't have that anymore. I am a, a labor representative for my uh, college that I teach at in, in Springfield and it's really interesting to see this firsthand. Because, you know, we're involved in labor negotiations with the, the management, the administration of the school, and there's almost no critical consciousness whatsoever. The, the head of the union, he, uh, he personally is a Marxist socialist, and that's interesting to, to have some sort of class consciousness in the leadership, uh, and a lot of the rest of us are, but when you look at the rank and file of the union, it's very much depoliticized. People are part of the union technically, and they see it as a way to get pay raises, and it really doesn't do much besides that. It's what you would call depoliticized. It's about a craft, you know, making more money for teachers, and it's not really doing anything else. So the decline of labor is, is really, really important because now you have this, this force that used to be there, and it, it can't pull at least one of the parties in a more kind of left direction. Another really big thing is, is youth. Uh, there is a, a trend in the last... 50 to 60 years, and I don't think I'm old enough to come off as a curmudgeon here, but I'm going to anyways. Uh, what's wrong with youth today, right? We can all have that discussion. <laughs> there's not too many young people in, in the audience here, right? So what's going on? Well, there's been a trend in the last, let's say, 30 to 40 years where young people have kind of t increasingly tuned out from following the news and become less likely to vote in this hit its worst point, you would say, between the 1990s and 2000. Um, a really big issue. In, in, in 1972, that demographic of 18 to 29-year-olds, a majority of them voted. It wasn't a large majority, but it was about 55%. By 2000, it's about a third. If you go into the 1990 elections for president and the 2000 election, it was closer to about a third, maybe 35%, at most 40, depending on the election. You saw a massive decline in participation. Now, why does that matter? Because young people don't have any money. They're poor. They don't have much. So they're much more likely to be on the liberal side of things when you talk about things like redistribution, because they're going to take anything the government gives them. So you have a very potentially... Uh, leftist force in American politics that has really been kind of tuned out and demobilized in the last 30 or 40 years. A lot of this has to do, apparently, if you look at a lot of communication and political science studies with the media. There's this thing called fragmentation going on, and everybody knows what this is. If you look at media options in the last 20 or 30 years, there are so many choices today. 
that people don't have to follow politics in the news anymore. So if you go back to the 1950s or 60s or 70s before the era of cable and all these other choices that proliferated, you wanted to watch TV at 5 or 6 o'clock, you were pretty much going to have to watch the news. There was a consciousness of these things that existed back then, and it really doesn't exist to the same level today. Uh, now you can do whatever you want. If you want to watch Hoarders on TLC or all these other shows about pathological people, and that's what all these cable shows are, right? People who are pathological, basically, and they will go from one freak show to the next on these reality shows. You can do that 24-7, and you can watch it on demand, and you don't have to be confronted with anything else. You can watch ESPN all day long. You can go online. You can go to Netflix or Hulu or whatever it is that you want to do. And no one can stop you because you have all these choices. What that's done is it's depoliticized people. People who would have followed politics before because they had to and learned something and learned why it's important, they do it less so now. Uh, so they, they tune out. So um, this was a business strategy. This is great for profits. Companies love this because if you fragment audiences, you can more effectively narrow cast your products for advertising. It's great. It's a wonderful business strategy because you get more effective advertising with proliferation of choices. It also happens to be really, really lousy for democracy. So when people talk about the media as the fifth estate and the representative of the public, the media has been leading the way in depoliticization. And this is a really big thing for, uh, for young Americans. So that's a really big factor that's worth talking about. Another really big one is the rise of the religious right. This has been a big thing since the 1980s onward. Uh, they were not religious Americans, especially if you're talking about evangelical Americans and many Americans of a strong faithful background. They were not as organized behind conservative Republican politics 40 or 50 years ago as they are today. You can see this. It, it's really gotten to alarming numbers in the last few years. You have these clearly religiously inspired sentiments in public opinion. And you think about it, and you're like, you think, where the hell are these things coming from? These clearly, I, I guess there's no other way to say it, wacko, wacko kind of, of opinions you find in polls. For example, I was, I was looking at this for my class. Uh, I teach about public ignorance in my American government class. Apparently one in four Republicans think Obama is literally the Antichrist. Yeah. Yeah. It's literally the Antichrist, not figuratively, literally. One in four Republicans, which is not an insignificant number of people. More than half of uh, Republicans, when these polls were being done between 2010 and 2011, they said, well, you know, Obama, he's not born in this country. Or, or well, we can't be sure. And, and this narrative gets created around a, a politician who, if anybody's actually been paying attention critically, you know that he's one of the most kind of mild-mannered center, center-right candidates in a really long time. And how, how does this guy get, he gets portrayed as, well, he's a crazy, Muslim, demonic, socialist, Kenyan terror guy. And, you know, they've got these documentaries out, like uh, 2016. This is the big one, right, for the election season. And I, I hear from my students, their parents would drag them to it because they wouldn't see it on their own. And say, well, it really makes you think. And I'm like, well, actually, that was the opposite of what I got out of that movie. I thought it really made you not think. You really have to be indoctrinated to accept any of this nonsense. It goes against everything that uh, political scientists study with international politics. It's just complete nonsense and gibberish. Uh, but these kinds of views have, have become very common. And I, I think a lot of this is a function of the rise of religious right as an organized political force. Uh, if you look at born-again evangelicals, for example, this is a very interesting uh, thing that's happened. They were 48% of Americans in 2005. 48% of Americans said they were either born again, evangelicals, or of the evangelical faith in general. About one in two Americans said that. Now there's obviously a lot of diversity within the ranks. If you look at uh, evangelicals, there's different types of evangelicals, and they're very much differentiated by race and um, income based on their ideology. So for example, non-white evangelicals are far less reactionary uh, and lower income evangelicals are far less reactionary, so there's some diversity there within the, that community. But overwhelmingly, if you look at the general trend, it is a, a reactionary force. Um, so it, it's gone up dramatically. What's been happening is that a lot of churches and, and um, religious forces, particularly on the right, got organized in the last 30 years. 
They became very active in electoral politics and particularly allied with the Republican Party. So whereas in the 1970s you might see a lot of evangelicals voting for someone like Jimmy Carter, a Democrat who had a very big public image of being a, you know, evangelical or religious kind of persuasion. Now that's all gone now. You know, you don't see that kind of flocking to the Democratic Party in the numbers that you might have seen before. Uh, you know, you see the rise of televangelism, the moral majority in the 1980s, and then other groups took the reins later on after they kind of declined. Um, and, and this is a force that's really become quite powerful in the last 20 or 30 years. So whether it's people being socialized in their families or in these churches or televangelism or Republican officials taking up this mantle of this kind of rhetoric, you see a lot of it in this last election. I don't go in for a lot of the culture war stuff as my major analysis. I usually focus more on economics and, and foreign policy, but I mean, you have to be blind in this last election not to see how extreme a lot of the religious rhetoric had, had become. You know, people talking about the senator, uh, these senators, you know, women should be grateful if they get raped because it's a gift from God, right? What's the problem? You, you, you know, you have a child who's uh, the result of a rape, well, you should be happy about that. And, you know, obviously these people got defeated, but I mean, how can you even make these statements and think that you have a chance at getting reelected? It really says something about how far a lot of, um, how far this religious right, uh, this force has, has gone in American American politics. So that's something that, that also has to be addressed here. And it has dramatically pulled the, the Republican Party to the right. That's a big force here. Uh, the last big thing is inequality. We are now at record levels, right? Since uh, If you look at the, the data, there have been lots of studies on this. Highest level of inequality since, what, 1929? 1900. Yeah, it's probably uh, closer to that, you know, if you look at a lot of the numbers I've seen have been a couple years old, really, and these numbers get updated. It's got to have been more extreme in the last few years, particularly. So a lot of the numbers from even prior to the recession were saying, like, highest level since basically right before the Depression began. Uh, and it's become more extreme. Uh, so why is this relevant? Why is this relevant for the system kind of moving to the right? Well, because if you have more inequality, it means you have fewer and fewer people with more and more money, one small group of people, who use those resources in an almost limitless way, as we now know in elections, to get people elected. Now, it's a little bit more complicated than just buying a vote, but money matters a great deal. There's other things that are also going on in terms of how members of Congress vote, but money matters a lot. It's been shown in empirical studies that for a lot of issues, especially issues that are under the radar, not the really high profile issues, but a lot of issues in general, there is a connection between campaign contributions from certain interest groups and being more likely to have um, members of Congress vote for what those groups want based upon getting those contributions. And at the very least, the money matters because if you don't take the money and you go against those interests, you're gonna be at a huge disadvantage in the next election as they mobilize around other candidates. So even if you're not handing uh, campaign contributors, these people running super PACs and businesses which give the vast majority of money, even if you're not handing them a victory on every single issue, you can't afford as a political leader to spit in these people's faces. And this is a, uh, something that we've seen in the last uh, few decades is that this growing inequality has meant political leaders are much more beholden to people with money than they were in, in previous years. Um, you know, it's really quite interesting if you look at where this inequality came from, because we have a pretty good idea. It's a lot of things. A lot of it's the deindustrialization that I had mentioned before. It creates a lot of inequality. A lot of it has to do with the immigration, and you create a permanent underclass of people who live in this country but aren't citizens and don't have any rights or ability to lobby or vote. And a lot of it has to do with just deterioration of people's pay, things like the minimum wage. There's this concept in political science called drift. You just don't do anything for people. You just don't raise the minimum wage as much as you used to, and it's not indexed to inflation, so it's always going to be losing value, despite what the free marketers tell you, that the rising tide lifts all boats. That's not true. Anybody who goes and looks at inflation-adjusted minimum wage dollars knows that every year the minimum wage value goes down. It doesn't go up with economic activity. In the last, uh, you would say, 30 years, economic productivity, depending on the numbers you look at, has gone up somewhere between 70 to 100 percent. And the value of the, the median family wage and the minimum wage has gone down. 
It hasn't kept pace with the growth and productivity. In fact, it's been based very much upon attacking that. That's how companies have become more profitable, by not paying people. So that's one of the ways that companies found a way to become more profitable after the 2008 economic collapse. They found a way to make money without producing anything. We have a stagnant economy and high unemployment, and somehow, by 2010, these companies returned to pre-recession profits. And within the last two years, they've returned to record profits. Now that's a really interesting and alarming accomplishment because it suggests that they found a way to make money without producing anything. It's called cannibalism. Well, we're going to expect our record profits, so we're going to get them somehow, so we're going to come after all of you. And we're going to keep taking everything you have until you stop us. That's what's been happening for the last three to four years. Um, so this is a big issue. You look at things like the minimum wage, it's a long-term trend, too. It was worth about $10 an hour in modern dollars in the late 1960s. It's closer to about 7 now. It's lost about 30% of its uh, value. If you take a look at inequality levels in the United States, I already mentioned that they are at um, the highest levels in you know almost a, a hundred years. But it's really quite fascinating if you look at the last decade in the in the 2000s, particularly. The estimates suggest that of all the wealth created in the 2000s, basically a hundred percent of that wealth went to the richest 10 percent of Americans. So the richest 10 percent got all of the wealth creation, and the other 90 percent got Nothing. Post 2008, it's gotten more extreme, if that's even possible. It is. What happened, there were some numbers from the last year, so they, they looked at 2010. They said, well, okay, out of all the wealth that was created, and the wealth was being created, right? Because they returned back to pre recession levels of profitability and even record <coughs> profits. That was happening. So, where did that money go to? They said, the, the available data said, well, but 93% of all that wealth created went to the richest 1% of Americans. We're not even talking about 10% or 20% anymore. You're talking about one. This has become so extreme today that even corporate newspapers like the New York Times and the Washington Post can't ignore it anymore. And they're starting to have debates about how, oh, is rising inequality a threat to prosperity? And big surprise, they've had these quote-unquote pro prolific studies in the last few years that say, oh, we just found out that rising inequality is bad for society. <laughs> well, duh. It's known that forever. Anybody who's working class knows that, you know, if you take away people's money and you, you cut in on their share of the pie in terms of earnings and wealth, that the country is not going to do well because you have massive numbers of people who are impoverished. Well, apparently this was news to the New York Times in the last year or so. You still have the people who, who brag about how great this is, of course, and you'll always have those people. You know, their argument is, I was just reading this in New York Times last night, well, growing inequality is great because it provides an incentive for all you ignorant poor people and slugs out there to work harder. Because you were all just lazy anyways, and now you'll realize to get your heads out of your rear ends and go to work, right? Well, I mean, anybody who's been looking for a job in this economy knows how completely absurd that is. Uh, I was on the job market in the last year and a half. And you know, you've got people with PhDs who've been in school for 15 years, brought $100,000, lived in, in poverty for 15 years to get a degree, and you've got 150 to 200 applicants per job for professors. So you're not going to tell people who are out there looking for jobs that, well, it's just that you're all lazy and ignorant. That's not accurate in this market. Anybody who's been looking for a job knows that there may be a lot of uh, low-paying jobs out there, but in terms of desirable jobs, those things are becoming increasingly difficult to find. Uh, you have, you know, some of the numbers I've seen in the last few years say, well, maybe, you know, one uh, position for every three to five applicants across the board, and uh, that doesn't cut it. So people want to work. There's just not the kind of opportunities that are, uh, that are needed. So this problem of, of growing inequality is a really big thing because the more people you impoverish, it means less of an ability to try and influence the political system in any sort of coherent way. Money matters a lot when you organize. Uh, it matters in terms of things like campaign contributions or just something as simple as getting out a message and using those resources, monetary <coughs> resources, to organize. And when those things disappear, uh, we need to look out. There's a, a really big problem. 
Now, why is all this relevant to, to class consciousness? Because we're in a crisis right now. If you look at the United States today, uh, it's, it's really quite fascinating if you look at the actual wealth and inequality uh, levels. The bottom half of Americans have nothing in terms of economic wealth. You're talking about financial assets. Half of Americans have nothing. What about the rest of the actual wealth? About 10% of that wealth goes to, or excuse me, two-thirds of that wealth is controlled by about 10% of Americans. Two-thirds of it. About 80% of that wealth is controlled by about 20%. It's just kind of like, eh, if you were going to describe these people, who would they be? They'd be your hedge fund managers and your Wall Street people through your doctors and lawyers and engineers. You know, people making $250,000 a year or more through corporate executives. Those are the people who hold wealth in the United States today, and half of Americans have no wealth. So it's really interesting when the Pew Research Center goes out and they do a survey, and they say, do you think of the United States as divided between haves and have-nots? Well, clearly, if you're looking at financial assets, that's true. It clearly is the case. Half of Americans have no wealth. They're what you would call have-nots if you're measuring have versus have-nots as financial wealth. They don't have anything. And you have this small group, you know, 20%, who have basically everything, and then you have that last 20%, which everybody else has to kind of fight over that dwindling share of the, the wealth. And yet you still have these numbers. Almost 60% of Americans say, no, we're not divided between haves and have-nots. And less than four in 10 say yes. So this is the fundamental problem we have today. As, as Robert had brought up, this is increasingly resembling, and really is at this point, a, a, a plutocratic distribution of wealth. And people aren't recognizing that. That's the, uh, the unfortunate part. Now, there are some encouraging signs. If you look in surveys, uh, there's some polls that have been done in recent years. For example, 60% of Americans say that, well, the differences in income in America are too large. About 75% say, yeah, it's true, the rich get richer and the poor get poorer. About three-quarters say there's too much power in the hands of rich people and corporations. So that's encouraging on a general level. The problem is that the public sentiment is a way underestimate of the problem. Because yes, people say that inequality is growing and it's unacceptable and too few people have too much power, but they don't recognize the severity of the problem. If you have six in ten Americans denying that there are have-nots, that's a big problem. And the reason why that's the case is because those people are ignorant. They are misinformed about inequality in the United States today. They're fundamentally misinformed. They have a general sense of some of these problems that I just went over. But there was a really good study about this by a Harvard professor and a Duke professor in the last uh, year or so. Got a lot of publicity. They asked Americans to kind of try and break down what they thought our level of inequality was. It was really interesting. Uh, the actual inequality level, I said of 80%, it's, it's between 80-85% of all the wealth is controlled by about 20% of Americans. That's not what Americans thought. When they were asked in the survey to give a number, they said, well, the top 20% have about 60% of the wealth. They were off by a quarter. <laughs> they were off by 25%. And then they were asked what they thought an ideal wealth distribution should be. And they said, well, ideally the top 20% would have 30% of the wealth. They should be about proportionate to their size of the population. A little bit higher, maybe but the top 20% should have about 30%. So that's your ideal, that's what you want. You say you want the top 20% having 30%. Well, really the top 20 has 85. That's a pretty massive discrepancy between what you would want and what the reality is. So people don't understand this. Uh, there's a couple reasons for why. I actually, as part of a research project, I've been actually studying this for the last I would say last three years or so. Why is it that people are so delusional? So I, I bring my students in, young people and, and older students. I have a lot of non-traditional students too. And I ask them, why is it, you know, for the people who say that we are divided between haves and have-nots, and for the people who deny it, why do you say that? What would be the biggest reasons why? A lot of it's just optimism, ignorant kind of optimism. 
People say, well, I was always taught by my parents and socialized to think that if I tried hard enough, there's always going to be room for people to succeed. And I don't define have not as anything less than being homeless. Well, if that's your definition of have not in a society that's the richest society in the world, you have a piss poor definition of have not. That might work fine for third world countries where everybody's poor, or at least the vast majority of people. But if you're in the wealthiest country in the world, and that's your definition of have not, that's a very distorted uh, definition. Now, I'm not saying optimism is bad. Optimism is a great thing. I don't want my students to come into my office and say, well, everything sucks, I'm giving up. That's really depressing. Uh, and it's not the way that we're going to turn around this growth and inequality. But what I think needs to happen is that people need to be optimistic while also understanding the gravity of the problem that we're confronting. They need to understand the, the, the level of inequality we've reached is at this plutocratic level and recognize that it's a lot worse than, than what people hope it really is. Uh, and there are a couple predictors for why people are not conscious of class divide. We don't have class consciousness, uh, class consciousness in the United States to the level that we should. Why don't we have it? There's two big reasons. This is um, something I've uncovered through just interviewing people in general about this issue and looking at national statistics on this. You can do statistics on this and there are polls available and it's really easy to find out what are the best predictors of class consciousness. Two things. Number one is socialization-based factors, and the other is someone's level of affluence. If you talk about the socialization stuff, it turns out socialization matters. People who grow up in Republican households they are so, that are socialized in a conservative way, people who grow up in non-union households, unions still do have somewhat of an impact on having people recognize inequality. Uh, I mentioned before that you know being in a union is 20% of the time associated with taking more liberal positions. There's still an effect there. It's just a lot weaker than it used to be. Um, but these kinds of factors, and where you get your information. Do you listen to a lot of right-wing radio? Do you watch Fox News? These kinds of socialization variables matter a lot. So the typical profile of what I would call the class denier, the people who say there's no class division, uh, Republican, conservative, Fox News viewer, non-union household, these things matter. What we have to be doing in this day and age is we need to do a better job of organizing and socializing and stop being so damn polite at family outings when your crazy conservative relative just decides that they want to scream their way into quote unquote winning an argument. And people just diplomatically defer. I hear this so often with family members and other people who are of a liberal or left persuasion, they say, well, in the name of going along, I'm just going to not talk about it. And, you know, I don't want it to be unpleasant. Well, we need to make it unpleasant. I'm sorry to say that. But people need to start making it unpleasant because it is an unpleasant. It's an unpleasant situation when you have a country where half the people have no financial wealth and the richest country in the world. And we need to do a better job of socializing people to recognize that. Because clearly, most people, whether you're Republican or Democrat or Independent, don't like this level of inequality. They want it to be closer to what I had mentioned. You know, 30% of the wealth for 20% of the population. And that's not anywhere near what we have. So we need to do a better job of this. Uh, and this is directly related to the second factor. Why people don't embrace a, a class analysis has to do with affluence and materialism. People who are more privileged tend to deny that there's a class divide, and there's nothing surprising about that. A typical profile when you look at demographics for a class denier uh, is pretty simple. Male, white, highly educated, secure in their job, um, these kinds of things are typically associated with denying that there's a class divide. Now, there's a certain amount of that you're just not going to be able to really challenge. And it's not that surprising, right? That people who are on the winning end of the class divide will say, oh, I don't know what the hell you're talking about. What class divide are you talking about? I've done just fine. I went to a good school and I have a good paying job and all these things. And what are you going to do about that? Well, what we need to do is we need to go to those people who are on the losing end of that divide. And we need to 
implant in them and talk about this more and socialize people to be more class conscious and to galvanize people who are already more predisposed to this who are on the losing end of that divide and organize them not only them but that's the place where you could be the most effective people who've been left out of this uh, system now why does class consciousness matter why is this such an important issue well one because it's real you can't create solutions to inequality if you don't understand the level of the inequality. And it's also important because class consciousness is one of these weird forces in society that makes people, or a lack of class consciousness, makes people ignorant to their own best interest. So if you take a close look, for example, the way people answer that question, do you think there's a divide between haves and have-nots? It's precisely the same people who say that there is no divide who are the kind of people who are more likely to take pro-business attitudes. They're the same exact kind of people. They're the same people, really, not the same kind. They're the same people who are more likely to say, yeah, well, poor people are lazy. Government shouldn't help the uninsured. Government shouldn't help the poor. Deregulation is great. Free trade is great. This is kind of ironic if you think about it. I've termed this, I call it class subconscious. These people aren't class conscious, they're class subconscious. They've, they've internalized the Fox News Republican narrative. The Fox News Republican narrative is, talk crap about poor people and people of color all day long, and everybody who's not white, upper, middle class, male, and engage in this blatant class warfare kind of uh, mongering, fear mongering of people, but the whole time act like there's no class divide. So if there is a class war, it's only because poor people want there to be one. All the poor, repressed millionaires and billionaires out there, they're the victims, right? So ACORN created the economic crisis. It wasn't Wall Street greed or anything like that. And the interesting thing is, and the reason I say this is ironic is, because, you know, you're actually proving that there is a class system by denying it. Because if it was the case that there's not a class system, why should your opinion of class divide? saying there's haves versus have-nots. Why should that be a predictor of all your political and economic attitudes? And it is. This is like what they call the miracle of aggregation. One person can say anything they want and blow smoke up your rear end, but when you aggregate a trend, you notice, hey, these are the same types of people who deny that there's class that take upper-class pro-business views. You are thereby showing that there is a class system because there's clearly a class ideology at work behind what you're saying. You've proven it without the whole time denying it. So it's all there already. This uh, system of class consciousness, this, is, this trend is exactly what you would predict would happen in a well-functioning class society. You would have most people deny that there even is a system on the one hand. And on the other hand, that class consciousness or subconsciousness predicts all types of right-wing pro-business attitudes. So you get these same people that say, well, if there's no divide, then screw those poor people, right? Because they're just lazy. That's exactly what the, the propaganda is saying. Uh, so we need to, to find a way to kind of challenge these narratives. And one of the ways I try to do that when I talk to people about this, and particularly students, is to just point out that it's wrong. If you look at welfare, people who are on welfare, there have been some numbers that have been crunched recently, and a lot of think tanks have looked at this, and economic foundations, and... Uh, it's interesting. If you look at people on entitlements and people on welfare, they typically fit uh, one of a few profiles. They're either people who are elderly, they've worked their whole lives and they can't work anymore. They've worked their whole lives and they still need assistance because they're on a fixed income. They're disabled and they oftentimes have a very hard time working. So, you know, it might make you feel good to rail against all those paraplegics who can't lift boxes over their heads in warehouses, but it's not exactly productive. You can do that if you want and complain about those people on welfare, but it's not really going to solve anything. And the other group is people who are employed. These are the three groups of people who make up 90% of people on welfare benefits and entitlements. People who are disabled, the elderly, and people who have jobs. So we can demonize poor people working class people all day long, it's really quite counterproductive when you look at the real problem today, which is just an economy that's stagnant and it doesn't have opportunity for the masses of people anymore in terms of providing for jobs that people might want. 
Now, I know I've been very uplifting, right? Yeah. <laughs> You're all going to come out of here ready to slip your wrists from these really positive talks. That's not my intent. The, the, the first part of this is really just to talk about the problem. I'm actually pretty optimistic about uh, some of the solutions right now because there have been some things that have been changing in the last, let's say, 10 years that are pretty encouraging if people take advantage of them. One really encouraging thing is, uh, it's kind of captured in the old cliche, necessity is the mother of invention. People are really on the threshold right now of recognizing that this whole system is rigged against the vast majority of Americans. In 2009, right after the economic collapse, those numbers that I was just complaining about, the 60% six, uh, of Americans who think there's no divide, it was more like 48-48. There's a brief window there for about a year where for the first time in, in years and decades, Americans were finally starting to come around to this idea that maybe the system is rigged in favor of people with wealth, and we need to start recognizing it. People are on the cusp of that right now in light of a stagnating economy and high unemployment. They just need that push. There's a lot of unfounded optimism. Not that you shouldn't be optimistic, but there's a lot of unfounded optimism. People are hoping against hope that the good years of the credit in the 2000s, the quote-unquote good years where people charged everything on their credit cards and all of their assets were in their home, and now that's all gone, right? They're desperately hoping that's coming back. It's not coming back. The only way to restore that kind of prosperity to middle class and, and, uh, and even working class people and to redistribute to the poor is you have to recognize the problem. And people are on the cusp of that. It's close right now. People just need to push over the end. And there's been some other encouraging signs of how that might happen. One is that young people have become less apathetic in the last 10 years. This was a big problem of the 90s to the 2000 era. But one thing that we could say that was positive to come out of the Bush years is it really polarized a lot of people. The numbers in terms of participation of the young in elections started getting back up to what it used to be in the 1970s. If you look at the 2004 and 2008 election, and I'm happy to say that in this last election, the numbers didn't fall off that much compared to what people were thinking. They're close to around 50 to 55 percent of Americans between these last three elections who've been turning out, and that's about equal to what it was in the 70s. So you have this group of people, young people, who have been active. What we need to do is be more active at getting them to come to events like this and other kinds of uh, things in terms of paying more attention to news and media and all these important issues. Now, you've seen a lot of it in unconventional ways, like Occupy Wall Street, right? You have people who are very angry, and they're active, and they're in encampments, but it's not manifesting itself into action. The only way that that can happen is if people actually know precisely what the problems are. This is where you know education comes in. So they can actually act on a, a specific agenda. So the, there's a, a, a group of people there who are ready to be mobilized. It just has to be done um, constructively. We've also had a nice demographic change in the last few years. Over the last 10 years or so, there was a, and especially in the last election, there was a lot of talk about how, hey, you know, this country demographically is changing. When you look at uh, people who are called minorities who will be a majority in coming decades. The original prediction was that we would be a majority minority country by 2042, but it's looking like it may happen a lot sooner than that. It's looking like it might happen by the 2020s. We're talking about something that could happen in the next 10 years or so. Uh, and this was really something that people started taking notice of in 2011. Because that was for the first time that minorities compromised a majority of babies born in the United States. That's where the demographic is going. And you have a group of people, despite all of the people who've been cut out of the system unfairly, when you talk about immigrants who aren't citizens, you do have this growing group of legal, uh, when I say legal, I mean actual citizens now, of an immigrant generation, who are becoming more mobilized. And this is a force that, as long as it continues to be mobilized, particularly when we talk about Hispanic Americans, because the number of black Americans doesn't really seem to be growing by any significant amount. It's about 13% of the population. It's been that way for a while. But when you look at immigration numbers and, and reproduction, uh, Hispanic Americans, it's, become, it's becoming a much larger uh, number. So this is a group of people who can be organized. And they're, by their very background, demographically, much more likely to be of a left kind of liberal persuasion because they're more likely to be poor as immigrants. So this is a very positive prospect 
uh, for, for the future. Another really positive prospect, despite the fact that I know how obnoxious it is to listen to, is right-wing media is in trouble in this country. You have a lot of money still in it, but it's really in quite a bit of trouble in the last few years. You've seen these people like Glenn Beck and Rush Limbaugh really on the, on the defensive. You've seen a very strong counter-mobilization against these people and their fear-mongering and conspiracies, particularly Glenn Beck being thrown off of Fox. That was the first big sign that this whole right-wing conspiracy theory phenomenon and extremism was really reaching its limits and might start to be rolled back. And within the last year with uh, Rush Limbaugh's comments about, along the lines of what we already talked about, you know, women who want reproduction access, access to reproductive technology are sluts, right? And that was almost the death knell for him in terms of losing most all of his advertisers. They all pretty much jumped ship and he's still technically on the air, but he's a shell of what he was. This demographic, right wing Fox News and Limbaugh listeners and viewers, it's still popular amongst people in their 50s and older. Nobody young is paying attention to that crap. They're tuned out. It's obnoxious. I show my students, who are typically uh, most of them of an 18 to 22 demographic, maybe 25 at oldest, they don't listen to this nonsense. They don't listen to Rush Limbaugh, they don't watch Fox, and I show them the clips and they're ready to puke. <laughs> like, this is unbearable. These people are awful. They're so unpleasant and nasty and hateful. And that rhetoric, that extreme rhetoric is, is in trouble in the United States, and I think that's a good thing, actually because it still appeals to a generation of people, but increasingly, you know, that generation, in terms of, of those viewers, is, is declining. So this is a real opportunity here in terms of control over information to, to have a different system. Thankfully, these people do the job for you, talking about how women should be grateful that they're raped, and how women who want access to contraception are sluts. I mean, they're really bending over backwards to marginalize themselves. We really don't have that much of a job to do there in terms of just pointing out how completely insane these people are. Uh, so I'm very optimistic about that too. Uh, these are a lot of the things that have been changing in the last 10 years uh, that I think that we can take advantage of. And just in general, this is a very wealthy society and people have become accustomed in the last 30 or 40 or 50 years to a certain level of affluence. And they're not going to give that up overnight, which is why people are so angry in this day and age at government for not helping them. The big issue when people are asked, and in polls, what's, what's the big issue? It's the economy and jobs. People feel like the government hasn't done anywhere near enough to help people in this economy. And people aren't going to give up their level of affluence and privilege that they've developed over the last 30 or 40 years overnight. They're not just gonna give up on that. So you have this, this group of people who can be mobilized if we can educate them properly. Um, I think it's just gonna require some time and, and activism. So I think for those reasons we should we shouldn't be all doom and gloom about this. There's a lot that, that can be done and, and probably will be done. Whether it will happen in a timely way or not is another question. The longer we wait, the harder it becomes. But um, I'm going to leave it there. Maybe we can have some discussion about these things. From this point forward. Okay, let's hold our question or comments to like three minutes. Okay, so we can get enough people with the opportunity to get up there and express themselves. Hi, um, I agree with about 98% of what you said, uh, by the way, which doesn't make it right, obviously, but um, I just want to say that a couple of things I think that need to be uh, added to the struggle. Well, first of all, is the notion that there's this, some, most people in this room have it, but a lot of people don't, that it is a constant struggle. That there's a war, and we're getting our ass kicked. There are countervailing indications. But I know when I've said this in parties or groups, I said, you know, I haven't read a good account of how the left got its ass kicked. People look at me like, what the hell's the matter with you? And I think, you think we won? So that's one point. Second of all, I think we need a st in that story, it's got to be the events, a story. It shows, hey, what happened? Say between the 60s and now. I mean, sociology is kind of interesting and polls, but I want a story, sorry. 
And some of the things I would put in the story would be what happened when the USSR fell and how that has affected, I would argue, everything. From the religion of anti-communism no longer being necessary to everything else around it. Also, to explain that we may be taking it uh, in unproductive ways, but it, capitalism is growing like crazy <clears throat> in the rest of the world. That's a big deal. That's where a huge amount of wealth is being created. And we've got to understand that we're now the small timers when it comes to growth. We don't matter much anymore. And that's going to be hard for our little egos to manage uh, collectively. Um, other thing I think we need to realize, I think we need to stay on message more. What I mean by that is, first we need a story to stay on the message of, but words like entitlements um, ought to be banned. It's not just a question of politically correct. A word like that suggests that people have no right to what they're getting. And that just saying it, that's it. That's it. Once you've said it, there's no way to unsay it. And there are a lot of other terms like that that the right is successfully planted in our brains. Um, so, um, you know, statistics are great. And then there's one more thing. I think in general, people like to go with winners. <clears throat> you know, Yankees had a lot of fans all those years. And the problem is, is that capitalism has won and won and won. They beat the commies. They turned the Chinese, et cetera, et cetera. And I think we've got to have a story that includes that, because that's what people, a lot of people, kind of in the back of their mind goes, hey, there's the winners and the losers. No sense in backing the damn losers. They won't say it. It may be semi-conscious. But I believe, I believe it's pervasive that that's one of the huge obstacles, especially among working people, where they go, what's the point of siding with losers? Okay, I'm setting up. Enough. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. Are we doing Q&A back and forth? Or? Yes. Okay. I, I think you brought up a lot of good points. Actually, the point about entitlements is wonderful. I, you know, sometimes I think we get these words, maybe not in so much in your case, because you're making the point, but, uh, you know, people who study public policy a lot, they use these words because it sounds easy for people to recognize, but they're the wrong choices. So I would, I would focus on it. I would say, you know, more of a human rights issue. I would agree with you. It's a human rights issue. It's not an entitlement issue because then it suggests that people aren't guaranteed these things. And they or shouldn't. how about that they paid into the system and now they're, you know, it's insurance. They paid for it, they're getting it. Well, there's a lot of ways to go. But. Yeah, but I, I think the framing is a, a good point that you're making. Um, I don't look at the 2012 elections as something where we quote unquote won. Uh, I think that, you know, in terms of my presentation, I, I try to be pretty clear that I think it's a false choice to say that you can have someone who's more conservative than an Eisenhower Republican, Barack Obama, uh, versus complete, you know, what crazy reactionary right-wing <coughs> people um, you think rape is wonderful. That's survival, that's all that is. Yeah, so I think, uh, you know, that's a, a really good point. We need to build something more progressive than that. So. And this idea, you know, you mentioned capitalism as uh, as one, and that the United States really isn't as relevant to capitalist growth as it maybe used to be 50, 60, 70 years ago. I think this is a point that, that needs to be driven home. I mean, you talk about stagnation in the industrial world, there's been a lot of discussion amongst economists over the decades about how, yeah, well, this is one of those saturated markets. Mature capitalist societies are saturated in products and goods and services and stagnant. And I think that's something that when you talk about the prospects of capitalism has to be addressed. and uh, you know, it's an increasingly stagnating system, number one, but number two, it's left most people out in this day and age. So maybe the system won, but no one else won. We're the losers, and you want to be on the winning side of a, a fight, obviously, but you're not. So that's something that needs to be pointed out, that this system has, has failed people. And so we can get that class consciousness uh, at a higher level, I think that people are fundamentally missing that, that point. They're still hoping for the gravy train from decades past to, to come back. And it's under current standards, you know, we won't have a middle class 
in you know, 15, 20 years, if the current trends that have happened in the last 10 or 15 continue, you've seen education costs went up from 1980 to 2010, 140%. After adjusting for inflation, health insurance premiums, 700% from 1969 to 2011. 700%. It's not sustainable. You have a tax cut policy that focuses overwhelmingly on the richest 10 to 20% during the Bush years. They get a massive subsidy in that regard because nobody else is getting those cuts in those levels. And then you just take a massive amount of people's money, whether it's for education costs or health insurance. And this is where a lot of that inequality comes from. So this is not the country that it was 20 or 30 years ago. People need to recognize that. They want it to be, but it's not. <coughs> Uh, thank you for your talk. Uh, you, you, you mentioned a couple things, like just now that I, I hate to say in my, uh, in terms of showing off, is completely nothing new. Uh, you talk about the mature market. Marx uh, said that there was something called he predicted something called senile capitalism, where more and more money exchanged hands and fewer and fewer goods and services were created. I mean that seems pretty obvious where we are today. Younger people uh, in the Occupy movement have a simple way of putting it. They say that, that you know, 70% of our uh, uh, of our economic activity is the financial the financial sector where, which is, if you want to put it simply, is just rich people loaning money to one another. Uh, I want to talk for a minute about a group you didn't mention who uh, have me particularly irritated at the moment. I. Uh, don't bother talking to uh, evangelicals and Republicans, even the working class ones, because uh, it's just really hard. <laughs> yes, it is. And I found that a lot of, there are other people in my life that are quote unquote liberal Obama Democrats who end up being equally hard to talk to because I think that they've lost their uh, moral souls. And for them, they're a different uh, profile than you mentioned. Uh, although they are winners, they're also Democrats and call themselves liberals, and uh, they supported Obama. They're very happy now. And for them, there really isn't a big problem. Th there isn't a big problem except for the Republicans. And uh, the, the solution going forward is just keep electing Democrats. And for them, uh, they're, they're, it, it, there is no moral problem with drone strikes, and there is no moral problem with the end of... Uh, Habeas corpus, habeas corpus in the end of uh, what little civil rights we had in the past because it just doesn't exist and they have their opportunity to read the Wall Street Journal and the New York Times they end up being just as horrible and insulated as the, the groups you did talk about who watch Fox and these people are just as hard to talk to because drone strikes and the end of uh, individual rights after, a thousand, after 800 years and our society uh, just doesn't exist. It's not a problem. Uh, you mentioned, you said that these people on the far right, what they say is gibberish. Well, for the liberal Obama Democrats, everything we say is gibberish. And the, the choices are between far right gibberish and our gibberish. And what they say is gospel. And I'm not going to mention any names, but there are some real charlatans on the left who carry the water for these people. I'm not going to mention any names. I'm just going to say uh, former founder of SDS and uh, a former president of SDS, and I'll leave it at that. Uh, but, but I want to go on uh, a, a little ways. You also, you know, in terms of showing off and saying nothing's new, you said that you look at where a person's resources come from, you know, what, what their background is uh, economically and culturally, and you can see where their political views come, came from. Well, Again, to show off, Mark Twain said, show me where a person gets their corn pone and I'll show you where a person gets their political opinions. And for those of you who don't know, corn pone is an unrefined staple that was very popular in this country 100 years ago or more. And I want to end up, again, in, in the supreme uh, uh, spirit of showing off. Uh, I was at a Seder, that's a Passover ceremony, uh, 20 years ago, and uh, th these were the days when I was uh, uh, full of piss and vinegar, and in the Passover ceremony you ask, uh, there's a number of questions that are asked, usually focusing on three questions, and a after the ceremony there's a time for discussion and eating, 
And I asked three questions, and the question I remember most that I asked was, uh, what's America doing to ensure that pe Americans are going to be employed in the future? And there really wasn't an answer, except that you know we can count on the market to do that, because because we're, 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 we're in charge of the market. And I guess what they meant was, you know, because we're militarily in charge of the world, therefore we're in charge of the market, and therefore Americans will be employed. And I said, well, you know, uh, Japan and Europe are putting aside resources and uh, altering and constructing and guiding their, their cultural uh, institutions to have people employed. And, our competitors in the third world are doing the same thing, whereas in America, no one's setting aside planning or resources or anything like that for Americans to be employed. And I'm really kind of unhappy that that question ended up being something of a prediction. I uh, would have preferred to have been wrong. And I uh, don't, <coughs> excuse me, I don't uh, have much of an answer for what to say going forward, because like I say, there isn't much talking to the uh, right-wing people and the uh, evangelicals, etc. And they're really, uh, and uh, my big complaint at the moment is there's not much talking to the liberal Obama Democrats either. So with that, I guess I'll stop talking and I, I, I want to hear what you have to say about all those many things I brought up. Thank you. Thanks for all the comments. Uh, yeah, I mean the, the whole stagnant capitalism, financialization, and crisis of capitalism, it's obviously an old story, right? So there's nothing uh, you know, I'm just situating my discussion in terms of that, but there's nothing new there. Um, I know what you're saying about, I guess I would call them the Obama Boy Scouts and Girl Scouts. Uh, you know, every once in a while I'll turn on MSNBC and it's pretty obnoxious to listen to. I mean, it's not to me that much less obnoxious than listening to Bill O'Reilly and all the other kind of gobbledygook. For 80% um, of the country, they're the left. Yeah. Your name for and I guess. I guess I would call it a crap sandwich, and you got to take a bite, right? You got to take the one that's at least somewhat more open and relative to the other one, and the true believers who know that Obama's, you know, the Kenyan Muslim socialist bastard, right? Uh, you got to start somewhere, and that's, you know, the people who are relatively more sympathetic, as uh, you know, I think, where we have to go. And it doesn't mean you can't call a spade a spade. I mean, obviously, a lot of, I don't, I'm not an Obama supporter. I mean, all the things you pointed out are exactly the reasons why I don't support Barack Obama and you know I guess when when George Bush does it it's a war crime right you know assassinations and when Obama does it it's just cute so I don't accept that uh, framing and mentality and it, it obviously shows how indoctrination works across both parties so I think that's something that needs to be a part of the narrative here um, so I, I, would, I would agree with you there I think one of the really big things is you know you mentioned how much of this is new I don't think that this room is a microcosm of the entire society. I think, I think that my role is, when I look at research, is to quote unquote prove or present empirical evidence for things that we all already kind of knew, but most people don't, and they want to believe that it's not true, and I try to provide people the empirical tools through my own research to go to people who might deny these things and say, look, it's all right here. Here's evidence and you need to actually deal with these things and that's kind of my hope when um, you know through these kinds of presentations that we talk about these things and flesh them out further and uh, you know this is a long-standing book project it'll probably take another couple of years to finish but you know eventually at the end of it I want to try and document how this kind of manipulation takes place and um, most people don't have the knowledge that people in this class you know, not this classroom but this what well, kind of a classroom right it's a university of the left right yeah. so most people don't have it you know, they're busy focusing on uh, working or the ones who are diverted from media or from politics. They're watching Honey Boo Boo, right, or all these other things that are going on. And we need to get these people back into the real world. So, I mean, that's what I think a good social scientist should do. They should be proving or demonstrating intuitive things that we already kind of suspected. But there's a whole manipulation machine out there dedicated to making people ignorant. And that has to be combated. So that's what I, where I see my role personally. Actually, when uh, Obama was, after Obama was elected, the first time I was hoping that all these uh, stigma and stereotypes will make him more sensitive to minorities and to class issues. Uh, 
But what happened is he tried to prove that he's not. And uh, that kind of marked his uh, lack of backbone in dealing with the Republicans. It's not the backbone, uh, but you're close. <laughs> <laughs> it's the other bone. <laughs> uh, hey, come on. Um, as far as the say, the, you know, the, uh, the myth is that the way that uh, the Hebrews dealt with the low wages uh, they earned uh, building the pyramids was by exodus. And the exodus today is the exodus of money to the Canine Islands and the exodus of uh, jobs outside. But that's how uh, uh, we dealt with it in, in this country. Um, there are a few points. Uh, and I want to mention other points, I, I agree with you, of course. Uh, but uh, what the factors that you were uh, mentioning um, it looked to me more like characteristics of ingredients of the problem rather than predictors. I wish they were predictors, then we could do something. Um, so they are ingredients, and, and I'm not even sure that all of them are as simplistic. Uh, for example, media. Um, the fact that we have more choices today at listening more than to the news or to four news um, is, is good. Uh, on the internet, I get uh, a lot of uh, alternative uh, sources of news. So uh, it made uh, alternative uh, sources of media more available and cheaper. Uh, I don't have uh, cable. I don't watch it. And uh, so uh, I don't know if that explains the depolitization of the young people. Um, it looks like a, a more pervasive issue of uh, some kind of cultural amnesia or something. Uh, and um, your optimism is based on your students. Goodness. Uh, what do you teach? Sociology? American government American. and other politics classes. Okay, that's what the the most radical students you should go with. <laughs> and they are your students, and they're going to be graded by you. So I wouldn't uh, use them as a sample exactly of, of awareness of consciousness. Uh, I wish. <coughs> okay. um, provincialism, yeah. Um, provincialism to me is a big factor in ignorance and the um, anxiety that people have about anything that smells or that has the word social in it, like safety nets or social programs or anything. Um, and if we could, you know, it, it, they have birthright to Jewish kids that want to go to Israel first time. If we could have a birthright of American kids going out to, let's say, Western Europe, the ones that are a little more socialized, um, and see that national health care works, that uh, all those programs work, just to open their horizons, I mean, I talk to people about health. They are so scared about national health care, and they, they simply don't know. They have to experience it. Now, how to do I, I think that's a good investment, actually. Okay. A lot of good points. Uh, I, you mentioned, uh, you know, what are these things? Are these predictors? Are they ingredients of the problem? I would say they're probably both, personally. I mean, they're they're... They're what makes up the problem. They explain why people deny that there's a divide or embrace the fact that there is a divide. Um, but those things typically speak to people's level of privilege and their level of socialization. So when I talk to, to people about this, and it's not just students, I've talked to a lot of people who aren't students too, typically the thing that keeps coming back over and over and over is, this is just how I was taught. I was taught in the undeniable power of optimistic thinking and socialized in that way. Um, so it does end up being a, a predictor in the sense that, well, if you socialize people in a certain way, eventually they'll believe that later. But I think it's both. I think it's an ingredient and it's a predictor of the problem. Um, in terms of my students, 
It's interesting because I teach, uh, the college I teach at, I teach general education. None of my students want to be there. They have to be there. We're the only school left in the state, as far as I can tell, that requires every student to take an American government class. 99% of those people aren't political science majors. If anything, there's a bias in Springfield towards people thinking that they're more center right conservative, because that's what their parents tell them that they are. And then they come to the class and they, they take an ideology test and we talk about these issues in the class and you know, it's like a little survey of where you stand ideologically and they're like, wow, I didn't realize I was actually a center leftist. I was just was told by my parents that I'm a Republican. Um, are they totally representative of the rest of the country? I don't think so, but um, I don't think they're, they're also not the, the idealistic people you're talking about. Uh, I don't teach at a liberal arts college of, you know, that kind of persuasion where everybody that I'm teaching is there because they want to be. These are all forced students. They don't want to be there. They don't have to. They prefer to cut out classes. Um, I agree with your cosmopolitan point, too. I think people need to be more cosmopolitan and travel and realize that there's a world outside of what they grew up in their high school and junior high and their family and their town. And, you know, there's uh, what we think is normal in this country is not really seen as normal in other places. When you talk about this rabid kind of anti communitarian rhetoric, well, it's bad now that people join together and do things socially. And, um, you know, it's, it's interesting. My, um, my wife's cousin. She's one of these individuals. She seems nice as a person, but she's kind of victim to this kind of nihilistic, well, not nihilistic, but narcissistic thinking, right? Everything social is bad. Put stuff on Facebook, as so many people do, right? And it says, well, you know, with the Obama administration, what they want to do is, like, you know, you build a toy. You build a something as a kindergarten kid. You build some blocks into a building, and then some other kid comes over and takes it, and it's yours because you made it. And my wife looked at it and she said, you mean sharing? <laughs> really? We're teaching kindergartners now not to share? I mean, that's a nightmare of society. I mean, really, sharing. That's a, that's a criminal thing. There's a Simpsons episode where, where, where Ayn Rand is laid out in the kindergarten. Uh, similarly, similarly to this. This is not normal. <laughs> if people traveled, they would realize how antisocial and destructive this kind of behavior is. And I, I think you made a really good point there in terms of people needing to be more cosmopolitan. It needs to be something we stress a lot in education, travel. Come on, Hi, I uh, want to thank you first. And I want to address uh, the question of your optimism. Uh, not that I disagree with it, but how to approach it. And the uh, reason I'm concerned about that is that a lot of people that know what you're talking about and that are uh, so-called progressive or on the left, uh, when they talk about these issues, they talk about their bottom line is the Democratic Party because there's nothing else. And uh, I had a fair amount of experience uh, uh, working with immigration rights and the main people pushing immigration rights, and they represent millions and millions of people. They were so scared about the lesser evil business that they spent much time in voter registration uh, and getting people to vote instead of doing something constructive about immigration. So I, I just want to, it just seems to me that the, most of the people who know what you're talking about and are talking to other people about how crazy their thoughts are, they're into the bottom line of the lesser of evil. Yeah, what's the vision, right? So I, I guess for a lot of people, the end game is just electing more Democrats, as kind of has been brought up. Um, and that kind of takes center stage, I guess, is, is where it sounded like you were going with that. Um, I very much am a supporter of of um, multi-dimensional approaches. So, I mean, we obviously need some sort of third party if Democrats aren't gonna do it, and they aren't, as we've seen. We need someone to challenge that party to make them more honest. And if, you know, they lose votes and, you know, we have an alternative, that's great. And at the same time, if the Democratic Party starts becoming more liberal like it was 30, 40, 50 years ago, then that would be a positive um, effect as well. So. I guess I'm kind of pragmatic on that grounds, but I don't view my goal when I when I you know 
talk with people. We have these conversations to be just partisan hackery and galvanizing votes for, for Democrats. I want people to you know, focus on a longer term kind of vision. It seemed like you were talking about there. Um, and, and you know, just simply voting for lesser of two evils doesn't really appear to be producing anything positive at this point. It's just, I guess it gets worse at a slower pace than it would have otherwise. Seems to be what's happening. So I, I guess I would agree with you in that regard. Yeah, in 2008, uh, I supported Obama, went to Indiana, Iowa, knocked on doors, phone banked, etc., and was very, very happy when he was elected to join those 200 and some thousand people in Grant Park. But after that, for me, and I think a lot of other progressives I know, the rest of his term was considered, uh, if you had to pick one word, a disappointment. Uh, for 2012, we're hoping, I'm hoping, and I think a lot of us are hoping, <laughs> That finally, uh, you know, he, he came into the Republicans so much on so many issues during that first term. We're hoping, well, some of us are hoping that he'll grow up here, that he'll excuse my, ex my expression. And there's a small amount of evidence so far that maybe he has, because uh, in this latest legislation, he only caved in a little. I think he went from 250,000 to 400,000, something like that, as to uh, the level of which they're going to pay a higher tax. The thing that bothers me is, yes, there's in a sense a victory there for liberals and progressives in getting the higher taxes, but that's a pittance. This whole big fight was over 4%, raising from 35% to 39% the upper bracket, uh, the income tax incremental uh, rate in the upper bracket, which to me is absolutely ridiculous, a pittance. We should be having a much more progressive tax system much higher at the high end. Uh, and is this re redistribution? Republicans say, you don't want to redistribute the wealth, do you? Well, yes, that's exactly what we want to do, what we need to do, because the market does not do quite the, uh, the proper job of that. And uh, anyway, I'd like to, uh, I'd like to hear uh, your comments on that. Thank you. Sure. So it says Obama promised to open change and seemed like he was kind of more of the same, I guess. Disappointment was the word he used. I think most people, a lot of progressives, at least I talked to, agreed with that. Um, I mean, there's been some some limited stuff that, you know, in the last, I guess, month or so. I mean, I looked at the news stories like you did, and I was encouraged by the fact that the tax cuts were allowed to expire for the 400000 and above. Um, relative to what I think we need to do, I think it's a, a really, really small thing, but possibly a significant first step, I guess I would say. Um, I think, unfortunately, one of the big problems, and this is something that people just have to pressure this president on, because he's not going anywhere for the next four years. He needs to, we need to pressure him to change the game. If we just talk about budget cuts and slight taxation code changes, and that's, we're basically losing the game. The game needs to be, what can government do actively to help people? <coughs> I don't care about budget cuts as the primary issue. We don't even have an economy that's been restored to pre-2008 levels. It's not even really close to that. Uh, government should be doing things. Helping people in terms of, uh, you know, whether it's public work spending or relief to people who are unemployed and poor trying to get unemployment down. Uh, a really great thing they could do is public works tied into environmentalism. Green economy initiatives. Creating these jobs mandating that they're created at home. Uh, there's a lot of things that Obama needs to be doing and as long as he, you know, plays small baseball, right? I mean, this is like a, a one thing that happened where I was encouraged. But, I mean, it really needs to be so much more than that, and he's not gonna get it through Congress. Not with the, how dysfunctional our Congress is, so this is gonna have to be something that the American public is active on, pressuring. It's the only way that it's gonna happen. First, thanks for a great talk. Uh, I was wondering, uh, Anthony, if we should add to the, one of the reasons for, or two of the reasons for income disparity would be the reduction of the government in employment. They laid off many people, and also they are not uh, giving money to uh, school districts that have to fire teachers and other employees. And also, the level of defense spending that we have today, it's at the highest levels ever beyond uh, the Cold War, beyond this crazy Bush's uh, maniacal foreign policy. Uh, 
excuse my being intemperate here, but and another is, uh, I want your opinion on uh, Occupy Wall Street. Do you think that uh, that has momentum and it has any real meaning? Thank you. Sure. Um, I guess I'll start with the last one first. Occupy Wall Street, I thought there was a brief window there where, I mean, they were doing the first step that needed to be undertaken, which was directing critical consciousness towards lack of perceived opportunity. And I thought that was really great. Um, I was involved in some early Occupy Wall Street stuff going on in, this, in the state capitol. Unfortunately, across the board, it seemed like it really just dissipated. And I think the problem was lack of a long-term constructive agenda. And um, I don't want to say cannibalism, but the whole idea of encampments, which increasingly became grounds for people getting assaulted. And the kind of negative stories that came out of that made it something that limited its appeal. Um, it was a really good first step but it needs to go beyond just a general anger and that kind of sentiment, and it needs to be uh, channeled. And, and these were, by the way, the worst offenses against them were in uh, cities controlled by Democratic mayors. Right. right. Definitely, yeah. Uh, that's a really good point, too. You made uh, some other points about austerity, you know, government kind of cutting uh, social welfare spending and benefits, uh, mil massive military spending, and reduction in government employment. I mean, a lot of the government employment jobs we're talking about historically were the best, you know, well-paying jobs and good benefits. I think all these things play into growing inequality. They're all part of the equation. Uh, the austerity hurts people, particularly people in need. The military spending takes money away from education and health care and things that could help people. And the reduction in, in well-paying government jobs obviously hurts people. They're all part of the same neoliberal agenda and problem, which is just treat people like dirt. So we have to kind of get beyond that level of thinking and this, somehow this ridiculous notion that in the richest country in the world we can't afford education and health care and <laughs> basic things. I mean, that's really a victory of propaganda and manipulation. And who will become convinced of that? Mm -hmm. uh, this is not a question. It's a comment So to abide by the rules here. Um, uh, reading Noemi Wolf on the attack on Wall Street by the Homeland Security, the FBI, and the banks in combination, the last article that she wrote, uh, that tells me that we are entering, and I, I don't think you going that way, that we are entering into a spiral, irreversible spiral of fascism in here. Uh, uh, we, we, we are losing <coughs> the few tools that we have, such free speech, and not being spied and persecuted for our ideology. So that's one, one comment. And the other is that uh, you, you want to find out why people are still eating the shit that we are eating. And it's, we have been sold a bunch of plastic shit on different colors that people uh, keep, keep taking us as well for us as something that will give them some kind of health, uh, happiness or something. Do I have time to respond to that? <laughs> Two good points. Um, fascism, you know, that's something I've worried about in recent years particularly, especially with all the rise of this kind of populist demagoguery, which isn't really based on real tangible points, but just kind of manipulation. You know, a lot of the Tea Party stuff that myself and Paul Street had warned about, you know, their, their biggest problem was that we didn't have eight more years of George Bush's wonderful presidency, right? That's the only problem with America. and. This kind of you know blatant demonization of everybody who's not upper middle class white male, and you know of the Glenn Beck variety especially too, right? And all this kind of nastiness, there really is a lot of potential there, especially if the economy keeps getting worse. It could go that route very easily. We're kind of on the, the precipice of that. The question is whether we're going to step back from it. Sanity is going to prevail, and people are going to actively rail against these people, which I hope is going to happen. We've seen some of that happening. I hope it continues, and I hope it doesn't go the other way, because a really bad economy is, that's a very dangerous situation to be in, because it can go either way. You can have what happened in the United States after the New Deal, where unions and activists became organized and turned it around and reduced that massive inequality, or you can go the route of fascist Germany. It could happen either way, and if people aren't active, that could very well happen. And in terms of the, the false consciousness, I guess <laughs> is the diplomatic way uh, to talk about the second point you made. Um, that's how it works in, in relatively democratic societies like ours. So I say relatively in the sense that no one's going to come in here and beat our heads with clubs right now for having these discussions. But in those kind of societies, you have to control how people think. And that's why 
those socialization-based factors like partisanship and how you're socialized and media attention, those are the most important reasons for why people are lacking in critical consciousness today. Those are the most important factors that go into it. Um, so we need to, to deal with that. We need to take advantage of the fact that this isn't a dictatorship. Not yet, thankfully. And become more active on these things and, and, and challenge this kind of manipulation and demagoguery. Demagoguery, I think. That's a good point. And the economy is not going to get better because the situation globally, uh, global warming, uh, contamination of the seas, depletion of the lands, uh, uh, in, in California, the, the, the very productive valleys there, they are being contaminated and they have been taken out of production. The, the economy is not going to get better. So we have to look through that. Yeah, I mean, that's one of those issues where we're really looking at, again, on the precipice there, we've probably stepped over it realistically with the, you know, climate change and the heat waves and destruction of the environment. I mean, we we're realistically, it looks like we're in a slow decline right now, or maybe even a faster <laughs> decline, depending on how quickly it happens. And at this point, I think the real question is, you know, can we do more with less in terms of decline and economic growth? And, you know, I think that's a bad model in general. Where does this notion come from that the world is our toilet? that everything needs to be used as quickly as possible and, and resources are endless, and I don't agree with that anyways. I think we need to learn how to do more with less and we need to be more ha uh, more satisfied with less trying to, you know, satisfy consumer wants for widgets and be more oriented towards conservation and using less. So that's obviously a part of the equation here. Unfortunately, I didn't get to that because there were so many other things, but that's really important. Okay, on that note, that's going to be the concluding remarks. Thank you, Anthony, very much.